What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and yesterday we dropped our draft party video. My homely, we did a draft, we recorded it all live, and it felt like we closed a chapter on the 2023 offseason here. And now it's time to look ahead to our in season content and break down week one. So that's what we're doing here today. I am going to go through my top 36 running back rankings for week one of fantasy football to help you guys get your lineups together for week one. So with all that being said, if you enjoy, make sure you get down below, subscribe, leave a like, let's go. Now, I do want to get a couple of things out of the way first here. First of all, we're going through 36 running backs here. So I decided what we're going to do... We're, it, in-season content for me is always weird. It's always tough to figure out what you guys want to see and what's actually manageable in my schedule to get done in a timely manner week in and week out. So we're going to try this. Again, top 36 running backs. We can maybe go to 30. We can maybe go to probably not 40, fellas. But we can figure something out. If you guys like this, of course, leave a like, comment, all of that. It'll do better in the algorithm. And that's the only way I know that you guys are actually liking these videos is if you know the views and the comments and the likes are there. Um, but I'm open to other formats. If you guys have other ideas, let me know. But I decided anybody that's like a no-doubter must start, we're just going to list them up at the top here. I'm not even going to really go through their matchups or anything. There's no reason to. We have 36 running backs to get into. There's no reason to waste breath on guys that you took in the first like three rounds of your fantasy drafts and are going to be starting no matter what. So our top 10 here. Now, this is going to be for half PPR uh, and full PPR. It's geared towards full, but I think that they're pretty much interchangeable. And as always, I feel, much, I feel much stronger about the tier breaks. By the way, the must-start tiers don't matter at all. It's just the first five and then the six through ten. That's not where I see that tier break. It's just so I can fit my face cam up here that I have it five and five. Uh, but the top ten guys I have listed here, McCaffrey at Pittsburgh, Smash, Eckler at home versus Miami, Tony Pollard at the Giants, Bijan, Saquon, uh, or Bijan at home versus Carolina, Saquon at home versus Dallas, Nick Chubb at home versus Cincinnati, Jacobs in Denver, Ramondre Stevenson at home versus Philly, Derrick Henry in New Orleans, and then Travis Etienne in Indiana, all of or Indianapolis. If you have all of those guys, you put them in your lineup and you start them. So let's actually get into what we're going to be talking about in this video. And first up, we have RB11, Joe Mixon. He is the first running back in our stardom fringe RB1s. We're, these are just guys that if you drafted, you probably have to put them in your lineup. And guys that I feel very good about being like borderline slash like fringy RB1s, you know, like top 15 uh, type plays that I feel solid about. And Joe Mixon's going to be on the road here in Cleveland. Uh, they are favorites on the road, the Bengals, and they are projected for the seventh most points this week at 24.75. Now, we're going to be talking a lot about team projections. Vegas puts out over-unders with spreads every week, and then from there, you can kind of derive how much they are implying a team is going to score. And then from there, we can kind of get a feel, you know, Vegas is like the sharpest projectors, odds makers out there, of course, and we can get a feel for who they think is going to score a lot of points. Again, the Bengals are slated to be the seventh highest scoring team this week, and they are playing on the road against the Browns, who allowed the six most fantasy points to running backs last year. You also have the dynamic where Travion Williams, Chris Evans, uh, Chase Brown are all sort of fighting for that RB2 spot. And that might actually open the door for Mixon to have more volume than usual early on in the season. And I think that he has like double digit touchdown upside in this game as like a three down workhorse and what should be a pretty favorable matchup. Now, after that, our RB12 is Jameer Gibbs. And I just want to give you guys the vote of competent confidence to start Jameer Gibbs. This is the perfect environment. I, I don't want to jinx him. But if he has a Kareem Hunt-esque, remember when Kareem Hunt his first ever game Thursday night football, maybe it was versus the Patriots, and he just like absolutely crushed. I could see it here for Jameer Gibbs, where this is just the perfect environment where it's a high over under. It's the highest over under of the slate here. It's like 54 points, Chiefs versus Lions, uh, Lions on the road versus the Chiefs. And that's perfect for a receiving back where they are going to be on the road versus the Chiefs. They are six and a half point underdogs. So they're. I think since the Travis Kelsey injury, they're like more like five and a half point underdogs, four point underdogs, but the road underdogs in a game that's going to be high pace, high scoring, which means there's going to be a lot of pass attempts on the Lions side and a lot of targets going to Jameer Gibbs. And if there's going to be a lot of scoring and a lot of targets, then we want Jameer Gibbs in our starting lineup. So it wouldn't make me, it wouldn't shock me at all if he had the second most targets or catches on that Lions team on Thursday. Now, our RB13 
is Kenneth Walker. He's at home versus the Rams. And this is just a great environment for a between-the-tackles guy and Kenneth Walker where his biggest knock in his career has been his catching upside. But this week, they have the fifth-highest team total, Seattle Seahawks, and they are going to be at home versus a Rams team that really shouldn't be all that bad. Like, of course, you have Aaron Donald up front, but to me, Kenneth Walker has, like, five-and-a-half-point favorites at home versus a Rams team that's probably going to lay over on him. Uh, I don't mind Kenneth Walker at all as, like, a, you know, high-end RB2 this week. Now, moving on, we have our RB14 here, J.K. Dobbins. And I would love to have him higher. Like, I think that you can make the case to have Dobbins as the number one running back in this tier. But there's just a little bit of volatility, right? We haven't seen him since the last time – or the last time we saw him, he was hurt or he was, like, dealing with an injury. Uh, we didn't see him in the preseason. We don't have a lot of clarity on sort of what his role is going to look like this year. We're excited about this offense. We want to play Dobbins. But you can only rank him so high with all that uncertainty. But this is the spot to smash where Dobbins – like Walker, is a between-the-tackles guy, is not going to catch 70 passes in a season. But he is at home, has nine-and-a-half-point favorites. I believe that that is the biggest favorite or, you know, the biggest spread uh, across these games. So they are, like, almost double-digit favorites at home versus the Texans. And the Texans allowed the most fantasy points to opposing running backs last year. So absolute smash spot for J.K. Dobbins. Then we have Alexander Madison. And there's going to be a little bit of an element with these where, especially for week one, it depends where you drafted these guys, right? If you take Alexander Madison in the fifth round, you're going to have to start him in week one or else you're getting a little bit too cute. Like the whole point of drafting Alexander Madison was for the early season projection. And that's what he has this week. He's going to be at home versus the Buccaneers. They are six-point favorites. They're home favorites. They have the fourth highest team total this week. So they're going to score a lot of points at home in the Dome versus a Bucks defense that's like sort of average at this point. Like it's not all that loaded. So Alexander Madison should get as much work as advertised this week. Then we have our RB16, Aaron Jones. He is on the road in Chicago. And it's just tough to have him much higher than this because there's so much uncertainty where we don't know what this backfield split's going to look like this year. We don't know what Jordan Love's going to look like this year. We don't know what the pass to run split or the pace stuff is going to look like without Aaron Rodgers for the first year. So there's just a lot that's up in the air when it comes to Aaron Jones. But at the end of the day, he is going to be in Chicago uh, as a road underdog. And that should breed receiving upside, which is good for Aaron Jones. Now, moving on from that, we have Damian Pierce. And right out the gate here, Damian Pierce is going to tell us if he is the truth when it comes to receiving upside. Because he is going to be on the road versus the Ravens as a nine and a half point underdog. Which means there's going to be a lot of pass attempts, a lot of playing from behind football from Houston. Which means if he's going to have that three down bell cow usage he had in the preseason, it has to be here. And if it is there, then he's going to have a ton of receptions. Now, I couldn't move him higher because, you know, they have a, a pretty brutal uh, team total here where they're projected to score the 31st most points this week, the Texans. So if the receiving role that we're projecting isn't there, then the floor kind of bottoms out because it's not going to be a very fruitful uh, offensive outing for the Texans is what I'll say. Uh, at RB18, our last running back in this tier is Najee Harris, like Alexander Madison. If you spend a third or fourth round pick on Najee Harris – he better be in your lineup. Unless if you draft like the most crazy, robust RB team of all time, and you have like five RB options, even then, Najee Harris, if you drafted him, should be in your lineup. It is a pretty brutal matchup, but again, for where you drafted him, I think that you're may, you may be getting a little bit too cute uh, sitting him in week one if he's the guy a lot of people drafting him think that he can be. Uh, but this is just a really brutal environment where he's playing – at home versus the 49ers, but the 49ers allowed the fewest fantasy points to opposing running backs last year, and the Steelers are projected to have the 28th most points this week. So it's going to be low scoring. It's going to be not favorable to the running back position for the Steelers, and there's probably going to be playing from behind, and that probably favors Jalen Warren in the pass-catching role as well. Now moving on from that, we have our comfy RB2s. Comfy RB2s to me are guys that I'm just very comfortable playing this week if I don't have these luxury options above or I didn't take a bunch of running backs early. And first up, we're going to have Rashad White, who I think is a fine play. He's going to be on the road in Minnesota and the opposite of Alexander Madison. Where Alexander Madison's more of like your between-the-tackles guy. You have Rashad White, who's a receiving back on the other end of that like really lopsided matchup here where they are six-point underdogs on the road, which you would hope – plays up to Rashad White's strengths, a guy who had 50 catches last year. He is a receiving back, a PPR option, and on the road in a dome that's going to favor points as pretty big underdogs, that should favor some checkdowns and some two-minute drill uh, and some pass attempts 
for Rashad White or targets going his way uh, in Rashad White. That is our RB19. At RB20, we have Miles Sanders. This one's kind of like bleh to me. Like I, I kind of just put him here because it felt like I had to. Uh, but I'm not all that excited about him. The Panthers have the 30th, high, uh, their 30th in team total in terms of their projected scoring output, just 18 points this week. Uh, they are underdogs on the road in Atlanta, 3.5 point underdogs, and it's just not a great matchup. They have again, they're not going to score a ton. Maybe they're not going to move the ball a ton. Like we don't really know what to expect from this Carolina offense with Bryce Young in there. So as much as Miles Sanders. You can kind of project them for a three-down roll as of right now. It's tough to say how much they're actually going to move the ball and what this offense is going to look like. So for now, I have Miles Sanders at RB20. After that, we have David Montgomery at RB21. This is a little bit tough because you'd want to play David Montgomery in this game against the Chiefs where the Chiefs have the highest over-under on the slate. And I think it's overthinking it not to put him like this high. So we have him as like RB21. That's pretty damn high uh, in a game here, that, again, that has the highest over-under of the slate. But again, this is more of a Jameer Gibbs a uh, game environment where they're going to be on the road as underdogs passing the ball a lot, whereas Montgomery is more of your between the tackles banger. But it is worth saying that they might bring along a guy like Jameer Gibbs a little bit slower than we'd like as a rookie, right? I'm not projecting that, but it's in the range of outcomes. And if that happens and David Montgomery is very much capable of catching some passes out of the backfield, you know, of course, being the main goal line back, and he can also crush in this game environment. After that, at RB22, we have Raheem Mostert. And this is what you drafted him for, right, Raheem Mostert, where you drafted him to start him early, and this is what happens. Like a comfy, you know, as a comfy RB2, a guy that feels solid to play with, he is going to be uh, in L.A. versus the Chargers. It's the second highest over-under the slate behind the uh, Chiefs-Lions game. It should be really high scoring. And at this point, A-Chain uh, still working back from his shoulder injury. The RB2 is like Salvin Ahmed. Uh, so it's going to be the Raheem Mostert show, to be honest with you. Like, I imagine he is their featured back here. And the Chargers, I believe, yeah, they allowed the eighth most fantasy points to opposing running backs last year. So it should be a good matchup for him. There should be a lot of scoring. It should be kind of some fireworks here. So to me, Raheem Mostert is a nice back-end RB2 play. Uh, and then we have Isaiah Pacheco. who's kind of like similar to your Kenneth Walkers of the world, where there's just a great game environment for your between-the-tackles grinder and Pacheco at RB23. He's going to be at home versus Detroit. They are six and a half point favorites at home. Highest team total on the board as well. They're projected to score 30.5 points. No one else is above 30, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so Pacheco should just be the guy who is featured between the tackles, you know, towards the end of the game. If this does get out of hand, uh, I know some people are projecting this to be a close game, but it is the Chiefs at home. It could get out of hand, and then Pacheco kind of salt things away late, chew the clock, uh, and he can just sort of find himself getting like 15 carries and like a touchdown. Um, and putting up a pretty decent stat line for you. The only real concern is it seems like Clyde O'Dellar could mix in a little bit more than we think that he could. And if this becomes a three-headed backfield, uh, then there are some concerns here. But, of course, we have him this high because we can't really assume that until we get a game sample. Uh, at RB24, the last running back in this tier, we have Jamal Williams. And just like Raheem Mostert, I mean, also his player picture is absolutely insane, fellas. But um, he is... Very much a similar play as Raheem Mostert, where you drafted him to be an early season hammer. <clears throat> and he very much is that this week. He's at home versus the Titans. Uh, they're home favorites. They're projected for the 16th most points at home here. Now, the only issue is that the Titans are pretty damn good. The Titans have allowed just the 31st most fantasy points to running backs last year. Jeffrey Simmons is an absolute monster up front. But at the same time, again, Jamal Williams is like the only back in that backfield. Kendra Miller is still working back from... Uh, whatever injury, I don't know. He has like he's had like four now this offseason, it feels like, uh, behind him, Kamara suspended. So Jamal Williams should be the main guy uh, in this backfield. I imagine that he gets probably in the range of like 15 touches and is a decent bet to score a touchdown here, guy who led the NFL in touchdowns last year. So Jamal Williams is a guy that if you have him uh, and you need an RB2 this week, he's very much a guy that you should be playing. Now, from here, we have our startable borderline RB2s or our startable fringe RB2s. And these are just guys that aren't very strong RB2 spot starts, but if you have like a hero RB or a zero RB team, I'm more than fine having these guys in one of your running back spots. They're fine plays, but again, they're just not as comfy and as cozy, if you will, um, as our comfy RB2s. And first up, we have James Cook. Now, this is going to be the moment of truth, man. Uh, whether or not this bell cow usage, he's been getting like a 75% snap share in preseason. If it keeps up here, then James Cook probably bumps up to comfy RB2s rest of season. I just would like to see it first. Uh, especially in this game environment where it's it's not terrible. He's going to be on the road versus the Jets. And the best thing that the Jets have is their perimeter secondary uh, and their pass rush. 
that's going to open a lot of checkdowns to the middle of the field uh, where James Cook is sort of going to be operating. So if there was ever a time where he was going to be sort of leaned on in the passing game, it would be in this Monday night game on the road versus the Jets. Uh, the Jets also allowed the six most targets to running backs last year. That's courtesy of J.J. Zacharyson's data dump. He drops uh, every week in season. So keep an eye out for James Cook. If he can prove it this week, then we'll move him up a tier. Uh, I just want to see that usage in a big spot like this uh, when it matters the most. Now, after that, we have Cam Akers at RB26. He's going to be on the road versus Seattle here, and he is a road underdog. They are projected for the 25th most points this week, so they're not going to score a ton. They're going to be on the road in Seattle as underdogs, losing this game most likely. And Cam Akers presents pretty much just a pure volume play. And that's kind of what you're getting with a lot of these guys uh, in the startable fringe RB2 area, where it's just going to be volume plays on bad offenses. But the positive side is, is before I hit record, uh, Cooper Cup is ruled out for this weekend, which means that Cam Akers is pretty much like their best playmaker. It's debatable, but I imagine like outside of Cooper Cup, Cam Akers is probably their next best player with the ball in his hands so maybe they sort of lean on him maybe as well in this negative game script they actually lean on him in the passing game for once we'll see if that role actually comes to fruition here so at like rb26 is a guy that you probably drafted around like sixth seventh round uh, i'm comfortable with him in this range after that at rb27 brian robinson's in an absolute smash spot here uh he is at home as seven and a half point favorites against the cardinals the washington commanders are and as huge home favorites versus a cardinals defense that is going to be pretty bad Brian Robinson should challenge for like 16 plus carries and a touchdown uh, and be a really nice RB2 play here uh, right on the fringes. Now, after that, we have RB28, James Conner. Similar story to Cam Akers. I mean, God, uh, they, the, the Cardinals this week have the lowest team total and they are projected for 15.25 points. That is awful. They're seven and a half point underdogs to the Washington Commanders. They're on the road. They have Josh Dobbs or Clayton Toon at quarterback. Like, James Conner is going to have all the volume in this backfield. But the question is, can these guys actually move the ball enough to get him enough yards and enough touchdowns or one touchdown uh, to make James Conner startable? Because he could, he could get like 15 touches for like seven points. That's 100% in his range uh, just in this environment. So you're kind of hoping that he falls in the end zone, but that's kind of what you're hoping with all the guys in this range. Now, after that, at RB29, we have Khalil Herbert here. Uh and Herbert's in a smash spot. I just kind of want to see how this backfield plays out. There's been a lot of talk that <clears throat> it's going to be two series for Herbert and then one series for, like, Roshan Johnson, Deonta Foreman. We'll kind of see how they split things in terms of the passing game usage and the goal line usage. Just a lot of stuff is in the air with Khalil Herbert paired with, like, these two new running backs in this scheme, along with Justin Fields taking a lot away on the ground. So there's only so much. Like, there's, there's a pretty small pie in terms of, like, running back opportunity in this offense that I kind of want to see it first. So I have my RB29 here as like a startable fringe RB2. Nothing crazy, but this is a smash spot, like I said earlier, where the Bears are home favorites. Vegas actually likes them where they're projecting them for the 16th most points this week. Um, and they're going to be <clears throat> at home versus a Packers team that allowed the 11th most fantasy points to running backs last year. So it's really, it's a, it's a good matchup for Khalil Herbert. We just have to sort of see how the volume shakes out. Now, moving on from that, we have our low confidence RB3 plays, which are just questionable starts, but in like hero or zero RB builds, you might just have to hold your nose and start them, even if they're a little bit iffy here. And first up, we're going to have Dalvin Cook as our RB30 at home versus the Buffalo Bills. And early on, I would assume that Dalvin Cook is going to be the 1A in this backfield. I will say that we don't really know, though, uh, how they plan on splitting things. They were talking about touch counts earlier this week, and Salah just kind of left it all uh, very much an open envelope there. But with Dalvin Cook, he's coming back off of an injury himself with the shoulder surgery. But of course, that's more brutal than the ACL with Brees Hall. So I'm going to lean Dalvin Cook here as the preferred start in this matchup versus the Bills. It's not a great defensive matchup, but at home... You'd assume that Dalvin Cook probably gets the nod a couple more touches than Brees Hall. I think that that at this point, right, when we're talking about RB30s, I think that that is really all you need. Now, after that, we have RB31. We have DeAndre Swift, who is going to be in New England as four-point favorites, the Eagles are. And Swift is a, a tough one because I want to put him up higher. We, we love Swift. I have Swift on a good chunk of teams here. But we didn't draft DeAndre Swift for week one clarity. And you guys know I don't draft for week one clarity. And DeAndre Swift's week one stuff is pretty up in the air here. Like, we don't know how this backfield is going to get split. 
My guess would be that Kenneth Gainwell has the most experience, so he's going to get leaned on early on. And then as the season progresses, we kind of see Gainwell offload a lot of touches to either DeAndre Swift or Rashad Penny or whoever else in this backfield. So until we sort of get a game sample of how this committee actually sort of plays out, for me, DeAndre Swift is a low-confidence RB3 at RB31. After that, we have Brees Hall at RB32. And I'll be honest, I 100% played myself. I told, uh, I think I think Bush asked me in the stream yesterday uh, from Fantasy Stock Exchange, you know, what are you doing with Brees Hall this, this week? And I was like, I think he'd probably be in the teens for me uh, after that solid report. Um, and that's just not the case at all. He is a uh, low-confidence RB3 for me. Because this isn't like this doesn't give a lot of clarity. This, uh, Salah said that he confirms that Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook will play against the Bills. Brees got the day off for maintenance, but nothing to worry about, and said there won't be a snap count per se, but they will be smart with how they use him. So to me, that means there won't be a snap count, but there definitely will be a snap count. So my guess would be, uh, you know, Brees Hall didn't practice this week for maintenance, and then he's probably going to be on a touch count. My guess would be like eight to twelve touches for Brees Hall. Now he's so electric that that might just be enough but it also might just lead to like five to six points uh, and he really does your lineup. So again, if you have any of these other tiers available to you, that's the direction I would go. Not a great matchup at home uh, versus the Bills. Like the, the Jets could, I mean, I'm a Jets fan and I, I try not to be super negative, but there's a very good chance that they just fall flat um, and lose in pretty ugly fashion. So we'll kind of see how this goes. Um, and that's this is about as high as I can rank Brees for week one. Now he could come out, handle 15 carries, and then be in this like stardom fringe RB1s like as early as next week. Uh, that's available, but going, going out on a limb in week one uh, does feel a little bit dangerous with Brees Hall, and I imagine if you drafted Brees Hall, you probably drafted uh, week one plans to start over him. Now, after that, we have our RB33, Javante Williams, uh, and also put Samaj P. Ryan in here. They're just back-to-back RB33 and RB34. They're at home as four-point favorites versus Las Vegas. The Raiders' defense gave up the fifth most fantasy points to opposing running backs. Again, at home as favorites. That is a really good environment for these running backs. Now, Javante is similar to Brees Hall in that we just simply don't know how much he's going to play, what the ACL injury looks like, but we do know in the preseason he did play. He operated as the 1A, so I'll give him the slight nod here. But P. Ryan's also a great play here where if they get out to a lead versus the Raiders, they might just want to lean on Samaj P. Ryan late in this game. P. Ryan's also a guy who can get receptions. He can get touchdowns. He can get red zone carries. So P. Ryan's very much in the mix where it's just tough because we don't know how this backfield is going to look. So I just want to err on the side of caution with putting them down here. But if like Javante's limited and P Ryan's the guy this week, like you could easily put P Ryan uh, in either of these tiers heading into week two. Now, after that, we have RB 35, Antonio Gibson. And we talked about it earlier with Brian Robinson. This is the perfect game setup for Brian Robinson, right? At home, seven and a half point favorites versus the Cardinals. Nightmare for Gibson because he's more of the PPR back. He's the pass catching back. We want him catching passes in a negative game script, and that is the opposite of what they have this week. Now, he does have the speed and the explosion to rip off a crazy long play and score a touchdown that's definitely in his range. Uh, but in terms of like projectable outcomes, uh, this is not the environment that Gibson is going to thrive in. You kind of have to get lucky for him to hit uh, this week in fantasy. And then our last guy we have is Jarek McKinnon, also in the Isaiah Pacheco game. Similar thing to Antonio Gibson, where Pacheco is the between-the-tackles grinder for a team that is projected for the most points this week at home as big favorites, which always lends itself to the between the tackles grinder because they are just going to salt the game away. They're going to have goal line opportunities, all of that. So McKinnon's like a passing down back in a game that shouldn't really give the make the Chiefs trailing. Like the Chiefs shouldn't be trailing much at all in this game. We'll see if they do. Um, but because of that, McKinnon, like his role sort of a little bit uncertain as well. Again, like Clyde Dillard, I think is going to be in the mix. Like it's going to be very, I'm very curious to see how that all shakes out. But you can really only move him so much lower than RB36, Derek McKinnon, because the Chiefs are projected for the most points this week. And that means something. So that is our final rankings list here. 23 minutes for me to get through that many players is honestly really impressive. For a lot of guys that uh, hang around this channel a lot and know how long I take on videos, this was pretty clean. Now, I do want to ask, like, I, I didn't go super deep on these. Now, first of all, because we don't have a sample. So a lot of it's just kind of vibes and projected workloads. Um, but like, is this a good length? You guys want me to go in deeper next week? Should I cover the top 10? Give me all the feedback. I need all of the feedback because, again, in-season content for me has always been weird. I still don't know if we're even going to do the same exact format next week. I'm, I'm always sort of trying to experiment for you guys to bring you guys the best content possible. And I think that sort of breaking down these running backs like this kind of gives you a good feel of sort of where I'm at in terms of like hero RB, zero RB running back plays. But, um, again, always open to, always open to criticism. Uh, I just want to make the best content for you guys. Now, I will also say... Uh, the entire rankings list. So I'm going to have like my flex rankings, my top like 50 running backs, top 50 wide receivers. 
that'll all be on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. On top of weekly rankings, you get access to my waiver wire article where I'm going to go through and give fab advice and waiver recommendations every single Tuesday for you guys. You can follow along and pick up all the same guys that I am rest of season ranking. So you can be on top of that for your trades Sunday morning, exclusive live streams on Patreon where we go through and we just give out start sit advice for all the patrons to get everybody right for the Sunday games. And if you can't support there, just leave a like subscribe. It helps the channel a ton. It's week one. It's time to grind. I hope that you guys enjoyed. And as always, I will see you guys in the next one.